So therein lies the secret of right action. To be calmly active, actively calm. And when in doubt, listen to your mother. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms and all the mother figures out there. Today is also the, well, we celebrate the birthday of Swami Sri Yukteswar. That is he over here, the second one. And he, he wrote this more daunting little book. Um, he's the guru of Paramahansa Yogananda. And uh, he was born on Friday. Uh, well, this Friday, he was born on May 10th, 1856. Now, I'll come to Mother's Day and Sri Yukteswar. They come together in a way that's very pertinent to today's topic. I'll come back to it in a few moments. But I want to dwell on today's topic, which is how can we do the right thing? The secret of right action. And we have to look at it from the from the larger perspective that every moment in life is a choice that we can make. There is always a choice, and the trick is, what is the right choice, and how do we figure that out? And we might define, we can often think of right action as, well, something that might help others, or at least let it not hurt others. Or we might say something that makes me happy, or at least let it not make me unhappy. Maybe both of these can happen at the same time, in which case I've hit the jackpot. These, these are all great ways to think about it. But from a spiritual perspective, we need to take the larger view, look at the larger trajectory that encompasses not just this lifetime, but multiple lifetimes. And there, there is only one definition of right action. What's the right thing to do? Anything that takes us closer to God, allows us to feel God's presence, take us into deeper calmness, deeper stillness, opens our heart in love, all of those, if it gives you an inkling of that, then it's the right action. And if it doesn't, it is the wrong action. It is a little bit very stark that way. Now, we have two very powerful tools that we've given to make this choice. One is our ability to feel. So let's say we're looking at a person, we are looking at a piece of food, say a piece of salad, or we are looking at a career choice, a political candidate, doesn't matter. And we say, well, what do I feel about this person? Is the chemistry right? Does it feel a little bit creepy? Do I feel like eating this salad? There's some objectionable vegetables in there. Um, and you know, this career choice, is it going to make me so? What do I feel about going there every day and so on? That's one way we look at it. And by almost near universal opinion, we know that this is going purely based on feeling is probably not the right thing, right? It should be, it's really not a very suspicious statement on my part if I said that. Because after all, we love to eat the foods that we don't, uh, that, are, uh, that are not good for us. You know, we, if you go based on feeling, we'd probably all be nutritionally extremely unbalanced, to put it mildly. Or we don't always make the right decisions in terms of who we relate to and so on. Uh, we don't like to exercise, even though we know it's good for us. We don't like to give up anger because it feels so, so, so good when you're in the middle of it, and on and on. So going based entirely on feeling is a very poor navigational aid in making the right decisions. Human beings, especially, have been given another extremely powerful faculty. And that's our ability to reason, to infer, to assimilate facts. Then we can say, well, 
I really don't feel like eating this particular salad, but let me collect some facts about it. Let me look at its nutritional content. And, well, I have convinced myself, despite what I feel, that this is good for me. This is a superpower that we have. It's, it's an extremely potent tool. And because we say, I'm going to do this even though if I don't like it, because it makes sense. Or we say, in hindsight, I wish I had known better. You see, these things that come from the intellect, the feelings, of course, come from the heart. So it's a head uh, and heart, uh, head, in fact, head versus heart. We are taught, and somewhat rightly so, that it's very good to be coldly objective, very reasoned, and think through things. And But here's the rub at this one. When we approach life, when we make our choices entirely with our ability to reason, then we are necessarily putting the feelings aside. That's why it's called objectivity. It's objective, it's not subjective. It doesn't have anything that relates with people, i.e. our feelings, their feelings, and so on. We keep it aside in order to reason. She say, she has a clear head. We really mean the head is clear of all the clutter that might be brought there by feeling and those kinds of useless things. So now, this can be useful to a certain extent. It can even produce certain amount of change, but it is also limited. It's limited in the obvious sense that if we are always coldly objective, then we can become uncaring. We can become not really, uh, we, are, we are not likely to make the right decisions because people are part of this world and our existence, and that's whom we work our karma through but it's also not good from another perspective that we often decide that I like this or I dislike this, and we use our head to defend that choice. Okay, most we are argumentative with ourselves and with others because of this reason that feelings are so powerful that the head exists, can exist, to only support it. Because here's the thing. There is, in the ancient Indian scriptures, they said, well, God, who is beyond all creation, decided to create the universe. And then he didn't want to be operationally involved in the universe because that's too much work. That's too much day-to-day, -day, uh, detail-oriented stuff that, would, that wouldn't coexist with his bliss. So what he did instead was created natural law not just Newton's laws of motion or Einstein or thermodynamics, but natural law that encompasses human consciousness as well, like the law of karma and so on. This natural law in the Indian scriptures has a special name. It's called Rita, R-I-T-A. When our mind becomes aware of it, it's called Satya, truth. So perception of the natural law is called as truth. Feeling the natural law is called as love. Isn't that interesting? Acting according to natural law is called as dharma. So you have rita, the natural law, satya, the truth, prema, love, and uh, dharma. This is how these are all related, but I'll, uh, where was I? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, I, I got it. So, the, yeah, trouble, trouble with the intellect. Uh, our mind has one superpower, and you know what that is. It's not so much to know the truth. That's not what it's capable of. It is capable of knowing what is untruth. Okay, so when the mind is done with something, if it's perfectly committed, it's perfectly unbiased, when it's done with something, everything that's untruth is tossed aside. 
Then it goes, uh, you know, in the diamond mines, I'm told, that you take this huge amount of dirt that comes out of the earth or from wherever, and you have these things that sort out of it. This is dirt, this is rock, this is this, this is that. But then the thing that does the sorting doesn't really know what a diamond is. Somebody has to come in and say, oh yeah, this is a diamond. That's the heart. You see, it's only the heart that can feel the truth. The mind can merely know what is untrue. Both are extremely powerful. That's why in the beginning, you do need this ability to reason and this ability to say, not this, not that, and so on. But then it has to lead to the heart in order to know, yes, this. Both are equally necessary. This is why approaching life with reason alone is not very useful. It can take you a little bit far, but pretty soon, very, very quickly, actually, you can start doing the wrong things, coming back lifetime after lifetime. So now I have carefully painted us into a corner. Right? Because he said we have two tools to choose what the, act, what the right action is. One is the heart. We go by feeling, well, we've already established that's not good at all. And we say we go by reasoning, and we've established that's not good either. Then what are we left with? We are left with Mother's Day. <laughs> so allow me to expound on this a little bit more. Well, in all seriousness, mothers and mother figures often, and sometimes invariably, know what's good for their children in a way that's hard to explain. My mother, uh, she lived for 96 years. And during the last four months of her life, uh, you know, people towards the end of their life, there is a time that comes when they say, I am done. And for some people, after they say, I am done, there is still a little bit more of life left. In my mother case, mother's case, it was around four months. And for others, it happens pretty much just before the moment of death, and they are fighting until that time to stay alive. But whenever that moment is when they say, I am done, being with them at the time is a time filled with a lot of grace because the attachments have gone. My mother had reasons to live for another four months. It's not very relevant to this. But during this time, uh, you could see that she was a little bit distant. And she had to use this machine called a BiPAP. And a, a BiPAP, it's uh, something you put on your nose. In her case, she had to use it all night. It's not exactly a ventilator. She could breathe on her own through the day and even walk and everything. But it helped her lungs not fill with fluid during nighttime because of whatever. I won't go into the diagnosis. It was what it was. It's a very uncomfortable machine. It was about eight years ago. Things are getting better every day. And I'm told that now it's nowhere near as uncomfortable. But my poor mom, who was 96 at the time, she was really scared of the BiPAP. And she would always go to bed at 9.30. And right around 8.30, she, this is when she knew that she'd have to go on that machine in about one hour's time. And then she would sit in the living room, and we'd see, kind of close her eyes, and we'd see her lips moving. And then, then she'd go and uh, and she'd go to bed, and one of us, if I was in town, then it would be me. Otherwise, it would be uh, one of my sisters or uh, her other children. It put the BiPAP on, and the agreement we had was I or someone else had to hold her hand, and then she'd get used to the BiPAP. It would take her 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then she'd release my hand and give me a thumbs up. And that's when that was my permission to go do something else. So this was an agreement we had. And then one day, we were on a drive. I was driving, and my nephew was with me. And my mother was in the passenger seat. And I asked her, Mom, what do you do when you know, are you praying at 8.30 when you prepare for your BiPAP? 
And then she said, well, uh, no, I'm, I'm not, uh, I am praying, but not for me. I'm praying for all of you. It's, it's, it's very sweet. And uh, at this point, there were six surviving children and three daughters-in-law, one son-in-law, and six grandchildren for a grand total of 16 that formed her brood that she would uh, pray for. And then my nephew asked, uh, Grandma, what, what do you say? What do you pray for each of us? And then, then she started uh, saying she had picked the one thing for each of us. That was, um, that was the one thing that we had to work on. That not work on in the sense of making more money or anything like that, but work on in order to be happy. It was so insightful for all 16. And she kept saying, OK, for you, I pray her, uh, Lord Krishna were her, was her, uh, the form of God that she liked. She said, I pray that you improve on this one. And she mentioned something. And that's my marching order since then. I didn't realize it then. <laughs> and she would pray for that. And she'd say, Lord Krishna, this is something that you, don't, that you don't already know. Of course you know this, but I have to say it anyway. Nothing is impossible for you. Will you please take care of it after I'm gone? And then she'd go to the next person. Then after about two or three of these, my nephew and I realized that, oh, something very, very special is happening. And she went through, one by one, all 16 of us. And she was so insightful, so filled with wisdom, that it was, you, you could feel how special it was. We were two guys sitting here, neither of us prone to crying, and we were looking at each other with tears in, your eyes, in our eyes. Feeling all by itself, the heart, is not capable. It can lead us astray because of likes and dislikes. Reason all by itself can lead us astray because it can make us uncaring. But when those two come together, when those two come together with no agenda, this was uh, the case in, uh, it was the case with my mother. She had already decided that she'd go. It was done. And she was able to think with us with a, she was able to feel us with a level of clarity. And she was able to assimilate all the facts that she knew about us over the period of her entire, our entire lifetime. And then what came out was wisdom. OK? So Sri Yukteswar, this, this is why you know, mothers know best. Has, it, it's an adage with a lot of power behind it. Because of this reason, and if you, if you double click on this, if you unpack this particular phenomenon, but you know, my mom was, I mean, she was smart, but she, you wouldn't recognize her as a wise person. Where did this extraordinary wisdom come from? Well, what do I know? I can only tell you what Sri Yukteswar says about this. So he wrote this book called The Holy Science and Kaivalya Darshanam in Sanskrit. And in chapter 4, verse number 6, he says, Shraddha Yuktasya Pravartakavastha Jivasya. Shraddha Yuktasya. Pravartakavastha jivasya. Shraddha means the love of the heart. And this is how, and pravartaka, pravartaka means initiate. Means you cannot get yourself initiated onto the spiritual path unless the love of the heart uncovers itself. And he says the following, which was pretty extraordinary. It explains what happened uh, in the car on that day. He says, when we have the heavenly gift of pure love, our mind naturally avoids the company of untruth and keeps the company of truth. You see, that's the connection. The, that the nexus of reason and feeling is wisdom because reason helps eliminate all the distractions, all the false likes and dislikes. And its only job is to uncover the love of the heart. And the heart 
knows to feel God. The heart avoids the company of anything that's ungodly. So, so you see where I'm going with this. It's in this imperfect world, the love, the tenderness, the kindness of the mother is the closest that we can come to this kind of wisdom. Okay. Fathers too, by the way, dads and father figures here, we all have a big role to play in this whole thing, but it's not Father's Day. So that's for someone else. I'm going to focus, <laughs> just in case you feel disenfranchised, that's not the case, but it is Mother's Day. And this is a very key, it's so fundamental that Sri Yukteswar says the first and most essential thing on the spiritual path is to un uncover the natural love of the heart. Without that, one cannot take one step on the spiritual path. That's why Pravarta Kavastha, uh, in this book, Sri Yukteswar says that there are three stages of a devotee. One is Pravartaka, initiate. The second is Sadhaka, one that practices. And the third is Siddha, one that's accomplished. Pravartaka, initiate, Sadhaka, practitioner, Siddha, accomplished one. And the preconditions for each, they're all laid out in the, we have to read this if you haven't. There, there are things in there that just comes out at you. It comes in a bit of a clinical language, but it doesn't take too much to go into the heart of the matter, so to speak. To be an initiate, you have to uncover the love of the heart. That's, and that's kind of interesting. I'll come to that in a moment. Then, in order to be a practitioner, you have to eliminate the meannesses of the heart. And then you become a siddha when the open heart begins to perceive the vibration of God as the sound of Om. See, that's the little progression you have. Chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8, in case you want some home study material. And the question is, how do we get there, you know? Because there's really two kinds of people with appropriate acknowledgments to Freeman and Sita for borrowing that particular way of speaking about things. It's really two kinds of people. Ones who don't know what it means when you say uncover the love of the heart, and ones who don't know how to stop the uncovered love of the heart. In both cases, there is an issue. And the key here is uncovering, not acquiring, not um, uh, refining, uh, not increasing, not decreasing, none of that. It is uncovering. It's always there. Uh, it says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter 8, it says, um, Akshara Brahm, Aksharam Brahma Paramam Swabhavo Adhyatma Uchyate. Aksharam Brahma Paramam Swabhavo Adhyatma Uchyate. Akshara means um, never diminishing. Brahma means expansive. Parama means beyond. So Akshara Brahma Paramam means undiminished, expansive, beyond creation. That's the name for God given in the Gita. Isn't that interesting? Swabhavo, meaning when it comes within us, when we find that within us, is called adhyatma. It's the spark of the divine. It's the spark of the divine within us whose form we perceive it as love. So the whole need to become an initiate, begin to uncover it, is what Sri Yukteswar says. And how do you do it? There is a there is a pose in yoga that Swami Kriyananda teaches this as the very first pose uh, in Ananda Yoga. It's called Vrikasana, tree pose. And it involves standing on one leg like this. I can't go fully because I'm going to sully my pants with my heel. And then you lift your arm up. Now, the problem with this is if you can walk, you can stand on one leg. Because see, you walk, you're standing on one leg, you walk, you stand on one leg. But if somebody asks you to stand on one leg like this, it's much harder. If you are able to do it, why can't you do it? It's because it turns out every yoga student knows this. The more restless the mind is, the harder you have the ability to balance on one leg. It, it all has to do with restlessness. Restlessness hides 
our inner strength. This is for the body. The restlessness hides the spark of divine love. This is for the heart. In both cases, it is the same. That's why in Yoga Sutras, Patanjali says, he says, how can you do the asanas perfectly? How can you stand? When do you achieve perfection in this? Prayatna shaitilya ananta samapatti bhyam. So what he says, chapter 2, verse whatever, 46 or something. It says, when you stop the restlessness behind the effort, prayatna shaitilya, and in doing so, expand into the infinite, then you're able to do this. You see? So it's all about overcoming restlessness. This is, this is what I noticed in my mother during those final extraordinary four months, having decided that my journey is over. All the restlessness had stopped. Ananta samapatti, expand into the infinite. And that's where wisdom comes from, when we are connected to the infinite. So what do we do to begin to get there. It's all about restlessness. Be still and know that I am. That's, now this gives it a entirely different operational meaning, this point. It's, a, it's an actual technique. There are many, many techniques, but Yogananda has this uh, wonderful book whose name I forgot right at the last moment. What's it called? I think I wrote it down. Inner Peace. That's, uh, that's the name of this book. And in it, he gives the following three techniques. First one, he says, whatever you're doing, give it your full attention. He says, even if you have too many things to do, especially if you have too many things to do, he says, you cannot do in one hour what would have taken you 24 hours. So why do you hurry things? So just give it your full attention, don't multitask, but Swami Kriyananda kept emphasizing the importance of finishing what you started. They all belong in the same category because they help us come face to face with restlessness and make the choice to say, no, I'm going to stay with what I'm doing. Because in doing so, we find an inner strength, find an inner calmness, the spark of the divine. We are closer to it, and then we are able to probably accomplish more. The second one is restlessness is a habit. It is it, for our planet. Uh, Sri Yukteswar said in uh, the autobiography of a yogi, he said, our planet is a restless planet. People with restless habits from past lives come here. And it, it, it makes sense. I'd love to go to a planet where restlessness is not a habit. I, it, it should be quite the experience. Uh, I'm, I'm almost done. I want to read this little, um, this training that Yogananda received from Sri Yukteswar. This was the kind of person he was. Uh, I'm going to read Yogananda's own words. My master, Sri Yukteswar's training in this meaning overcoming restlessness was wonderful. No matter what happened, he accepted no excuse for my becoming mentally ruffled. I used to go to the ashram and sit at his feet to meditate and listen to his wisdom. When the time drew near for me to go catch my train, he would be aware of my mental restlessness and would just smile at me and say nothing that gave me leave to depart. At first, I thought he was being very unreasonable. But after a somewhat strained period of this discipline, he explained, I'm not grudging you are preparing timely to go to the train. But I say there is no need for you to be restless. Why allow nervous excitement to ruffle the mind? You should be naturally calm when you are with me. And when the train time comes, calmly get ready and go. He made me miss several trains <laughs> until, I learned, <laughs> until I learned how to be calmly active and actively calm. So therein lies the secret of right action to be calmly active, actively calm, and when in doubt, listen to your mother. <laughs> oh,
Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. God is truth, God is love, Father, mother.